We're back um, after the bank holiday weekend, after the Easter weekend. I'm going to be live. Well, I am live, but I will be with Chris Maslin of Maslin's Accountants any moment. Now I'll bring Chris live on screen when I know we're actually live on LinkedIn. I always do this bit at the beginning to, to wait until I get the LinkedIn notification to tell us that anything's actually happening. Um, that can happen immediately or it can take almost a minute, which is what it did then. I'm just going to look down here. If I'm looking down, it's not because I'm ignoring you folk. It's just because I'm doing a couple of things on line, just like that. There you go. We're live now. Um, if you're watching, firstly, if you're watching, can you say hello in the comments below? Um, oh, Alex J, we are live. Roland Millwood, we are live. Let's do this. Thank you, Alex. Um, Alex knows how these things work. Um, and hi, Roland Millwood. It's good to hear from you. And M as well. Thank you, M. Let's yeah, let's bring that up on the screen. Got that wrong. I'm going to. Hey, John Scotcher. I'm going to bring Chris Maslin on screen. Um, I've never ever had anyone do that before you come up as private user chris there you go i've bought chris maslin on screen after a bit of waffle hello chris how are you hi stefan i'm very good thank you pleased to be here yeah it's um i think we're getting or i'm getting better at the technology i think you were watching the other day when just nothing worked for me um with John Scotcher, who I've just put up on screen now, um, to answer your question, if no one else asks, uh, if no one else asks any questions, um, yeah, feel free to ask yourself some. But hello, Jen Ellis. We actually, this is great. We've got a really decent number of people watching already. Um, tell us a bit about yourself, Chris, and tell us a bit about where Maslin's accountants came from and and where they are now. Uh, so I'm Chris, I'm 40 years old, recently turned. Um, I've been in accountancy for, for just shy of 20 years now. Um, the first five of that was working in bigger practices for other people. Um, 13 years ago, set out on my own with the imaginatively named Mazins Limited. Um, and yeah, that, so that's been trading for about 13 years now. Um, started off just me, my own little business. It's now a team of 12. Um, and as of nine coming up for 10 months ago it's, it's no longer my business um it's yeah it's now predominantly owned by an employee ownership trust i just put the website up on screen so that people can find maslin's because there's some really clear stuff on your website which we can talk about a little bit later on but the employee ownership trust that you just mentioned which is a, a big part of what we want to talk about this afternoon what does that actually mean to to the layman, to, to, to people watching? What does what does an employee ownership trust actually mean to the business? So in layperson terms, it means the staff are in control of and are the main beneficiaries of the business. Um, so the business that everybody's heard of that uses this model is John Lewis. Um, Perhaps not everybody knows the way they're owned, but we've all at least heard of them. Um, but yes, they've been employee owned for, I think about 100 years now, um, way, way, way before it was trendy. Um, so yeah, the gist of it is there are no fat cats at the top who own all the shares. There are no pension schemes who own the shares, no investors who own the shares. If the company does very well, then the profits get paid out to the staff. Um, and equally, the, the staff control the business. So. If the general consensus is they're fed up with the CEO, they don't think that person's doing a good job, they do have the power to kick that person out. Um, so we're significantly smaller than John Lewis, um, but the same concept applies to us. So you've just made the point there. How many people has, has Madeline's got? You may have mentioned it in the intro, but, but re repeat it again. To be an employee ownership trust, how many people have, have you got in the business? So we've got 12 staff. Um, it is a question I sometimes get asked, what's the, sort of the smallest size it could be viable for? Um, and I think probably that depends on whether the founder is staying on or not. Um, I think if the founder wants to disappear off, you probably need at least 10. And of that, uh, probably at least a couple who have not only the, the desire, but also the drive and to some extent the abilities to lead that business. 
Um, if it's smaller than that, then you might find once you take the founder out, you know, who may well be the driving force of the business, the business might crumble. Um, so that's that's the fear, because I think one of the main desires of the Employee Ownership Trust is that your business can live on indefinitely. Um, you know, if I die tomorrow, the business does not die with me. If that happened a year ago, the staff could carry on doing the day to day work, but it would have been very hard for the business to survive, you know, without me. Um, so, yeah, that's there's a, there's a whole bunch of motivations for doing it. But I think one of them is that that it makes the business no longer that dependent on any one individual. I've got a load of questions about it, actually, which I'm I'm going to come to. But if you're if you're watching and you've got questions, pop them in the comments below. Um, we will bring them up on screen like that, and we can answer the questions live. If you've got any questions about employee ownership trusts (EOTs), um, do ask Chris Maslin because he he does know his stuff. I had. I, I vaguely knew about John Lewis, and in fact, in around 1988, I applied for a job with with Waitrose um, on their management trainee scheme. So I, I remember sitting through a presentation about how John Lewis was was owned by the staff. But until until I started speaking to you, Chris, I actually had no idea that a a normal business could could do it. A normal business could work like that. It must mean, from from how you've just described it, quite a removal of of, of ego, because even though the business is, is still called Maslin's, you've just explained that you've handed over a lot of the, the actual control, even the ability to vote you out, over to the other people. So, so that, it, it sounds like you, you must have put aside quite a lot of ego or, or maybe just didn't have it in the first place to, to decide that that was a, a, a really, really good idea for the business. Um, perhaps I could answer that in a few different ways. Uh, there's almost an argument that it, it needs a bigger ego because <laughs> before the employee ownership, um, I was the boss by virtue of you know capitalism. My name appeared on the share certificates. But now, if I want to still be the boss, it's because uh, I need to be good enough that the staff are happy to keep me there. Um, so perhaps you need to be big-headed to think I'm going to give all that control to someone else, but I know they'll still keep me here because I'm that good. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's, um, I, I have given up control. It is as simple as that. And that is scary. Uh, you know, it's something that all employees are used to. The employees know that they come in, they do what they're told. If they don't, they might get fired. Okay, obviously there's HR things and all sorts of other stuff that gets in the way of that. But when you own the shares, you are effectively invincible. Nobody can fire you. Um, and so, yes, I've, <laughs> I've given that up. Touch with they haven't fired me yet, um, and who knows if they ever will. Um, I like that. Sorry, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in because what you've possibly explains why why we, we we find that we get on as well as we do because as you know I have a service where I charge monthly with no minimum term, which then puts the pressure on me to to keep delivering to to, to make sure that that people don't all cancel and, and walk away from it. And it it feels like you've put yourself in a similar position where you, as you say, you've got to be a really, really uh, good boss so that people want to, to, to keep you there, so that the team want to keep you there. Yeah, I mean, you're making me think there's, there's lots of arguments uh, on both sides in terms of the founder staying around an employee-owned business. So I think what I've done is not normal. Um, most commonly, it would be the owner of the business who's perhaps in their 60s, um, is looking to retire. Um, and, you know, they'll have a few options open to them. They might have a child who they could pass the business on to, but that's not always the case. They can potentially sell the business to a third party, often called a trade sale. Um, but that, you know, can be a good option in some situations, but it often doesn't sit well. Uh, and it certainly didn't with me. So, you know, I knew hypothetically if i had have sold maslin's to one of our bigger competitors which is an option that would have been open to us probably their first step post buying would have been to fire half the staff you know streamline the company and um, they potentially would have then increased fees to the clients um, so this is the it's a situation that reminds me of a, a david brent scene in the office where he talks about you know good news and bad news the bad news is you guys are all losing your jobs but the good news is i've just been promoted 
Um, and that scene really stuck in my head when thinking about me doing a trade sale, because I think that's what it would have been. I walk off with a large amount of cash in my back pocket. The staff, well, good luck, fend for yourselves. Um, so the Employee Ownership Trust is just a, a nicer way, I see, of, of transferring that, that control and that power away from me. Um, I should stress it's not altruistic. Um, so it can be to some extent, but I have sold the business. I've not given the business. Um, and that's one of the complications of the EOT in that, unlike perhaps a management buyout, none of the staff have individually put any money in. So you might be thinking, well, hold on, if no one's put any money in and you sold the business, how are you getting the money out? Um, and yes, that, that's the dilemma. So what generally happens with the Employee Ownership Trust is the, the company effectively gives me a big IOU. So I say, right, I no longer own these shares anymore. This trust does. And the trust says, thank you very much, but we haven't got any money. Um, but the trust, because it now owns the shares of the company, it's entitled to the profits going forwards from that company. So it will use a reasonable chunk of those to pay me off gradually over multiple years. So that in itself has complications. It means that from the staff's perspective, on the one hand, they hear, yeah, we're going to get all the profits from now on, ah, but only after... Chris has been paid X pounds, um, but it seems it, it's the nicest way of doing it. And, you know, also it, in, it in strongly encourages me to secure the at least short term future of the business, because if the business were to collapse shortly after the transfer, I don't get paid. Um, so that's not the only reason I'm hanging around, um, but certainly it aligns those motivations that the staff obviously want the business to succeed for the short and the long term. I, as an absolute minimum, want it to to succeed for a short term because otherwise I've potentially sold my, my business to something that can't pay me. Um, but as you mentioned, it's still got my name on the top of the company. So I'm sure that I will want it to succeed long term, if nothing else, perhaps just because of ego, like you mentioned. I, I, I was so busy listening to you. I wasn't looking at the comments. And actually, if if anyone's got any comments or questions, please, please do put them in the comments below. And, and Chris and I will, will at least talk about them. It's... It's absolutely fascinating me because this huge win-win situation that, that, that you talk about, um, when, gosh, back at the beginning of the century, I was given the opportunity to, to buy the business I worked for after the owner had retired, but that would be only after he had retired and I would be paying him back for, for a number of years. It, it feels as though you've shifted all of that forward. So I presume then that at some point in the future, you can then make that decision whether you retire from the business, whether you keep the, the part of the business that you still own, I presume that you can make that decision in future. Yes, so, so there's quite a lot of flexibility. Um, again, that's perhaps a benefit over a trade sale where if I were to sell the shares to a competitor, they might want me and some of the staff to stay on in the very short term to smooth the transition, but probably they would want shot at me after that because you know they've obviously got bright ideas on how to run things. Um, and there may be some overlap with that in the employee ownership trust. I think there, you know, most businesses will have some staff who will be thinking, this owner doesn't know what he's doing. I can't wait for him or her to, to jump out so I can take the lead and finally push this business forward in the right direction. Um, so there's always an element of that. And I think it's, um, you know, things are going well, but there have been a few little, not quite locking of horns, but um, I'm not quite sure how to put it. You know, previous to the transfer, I was the boss. Everyone knew that there was no, no debate about that. And if there was, it would have been quite a short debate with them getting a slap down. Whereas now it is a lot more gray. Um, so I still have some power. I'm still a senior employee, but I, uh, you know, I can be outvoted on things. And most of the time I like it when I am. <laughs> um, perhaps a little bit like you said with your clients, uh, you know, there's something nice about handing that power to somebody else. Um, you know, it's a, a weight off your shoulders. But yeah, on the whole, it works quite well. And I'm sort of making a real point to uh, try my best to remember that I can't just go off and make decisions by myself. Or I can, but if I do, then I'm just like any maverick employee who does that, and I deserve a slap. <laughs> you know, if I go off and start signing commitments to, to various things, it's, it's not in my power to do that. So I need to be more consultative and get agreement with the senior team. Yeah, I, I think that's what I meant by the removal of ego, because that, for any business owner, that would take a hugely different discipline to, to that 
which we're used to when, when broadly speaking, we can just make all of the decisions ourselves. The, the buck stops with us, of course, but we can we can carry on and make those decisions with, with precious little consultation. For for anyone watching us, you've you've talked about some of the situations, the win-wins, what day to day, rather than when um, when it's completely paid off or when you decide to, to retire, day to day, what are the, 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 the major benefits for the business? Benefits for the business? Um, well, some stuff might say me, <laughs> me being further away from it. Um, I, I, a lot of them are very, what I might call soft or fluffy. And so it's quite hard to sort of directly measure them. But to give you one example, um, the Employee Ownership Association, which is like a, a not-for-profit sort of union uh, that helps guide employee-owned businesses, they've done various studies which suggest that in the year following transition to employee ownership, apparently productivity goes up by 7%. Um, so exactly what that means, I don't know. But the gist of it is, is that the business is 7% more productive after the transfer than before. Now, there's always a little bit of you as the ex-owner that gets upset at that because that tells you that all of those staff members are deliberately slacking by at least 7% <laughs> because they're only working for you and so they don't care quite as much as they might otherwise. Um, but yeah, it, it's hard for us to, to pin that down and I can't prove that that's applied to us with any numbers from our end. But I do think certainly there's two of the most senior staff that work here. Um, I've I'm hesitating because I, in theory, I formally appointed them as directors. Only one of them appears on company's house at this precise moment. The other one should appear fairly soon just because of red tape reasons. Um, but I think this is this has made it clear to them that on the plus side, hey, this is a promotion and you have more power and you have a bigger salary. Um, but the flip side, I've also made it quite clear to them that they have more responsibility now. Um, so I don't know whether this benefits the business, but I did make it quite clear that even though I'm hanging around and I'm still potentially here for the long term, there's certain things that I did take responsibility for prior to the transfer that I'm not prepared to do anymore. Because they're just the bits that I enjoyed least about the business. So I've formally handed those on. And I think that, you know, again, it's not something I can prove with any numbers, but I think the staff have all felt a bit of extra, uh, you know, puffed out chest slightly that they have a little bit more power. Um, again, I'm waffling on, but one other thing that leads me to is to stress about the Employee Ownership Trust. Individually, no one staff member has any significant power, and that includes me. So the key thing is it's, um, it's not quite a democracy as such, but it's all about giving power to the masses. So if you've got one upstart who has a real problem with something the business is doing and wants to change everything, unless they can convince a majority they're just no different to before. They can sit and whine if they want, but they're not going to achieve much. Um, but it's all about the collective of the staff having that power. And I, I think the I picked up on the seven percent figure that you mentioned, which I, I guess is is difficult to quantify in accountancy terms. It, it feels to me as as if that would have a direct benefit to the client or the customer. I asked really specifically about the benefits to, to the business. But you and I have also talked about this. This must make a difference to your clients because they are dealing with someone who very literally owns the business, sounding a bit um, Victor Kayam if, if, if people are as old as me. But clients are actually dealing with someone who's got part ownership of the business. And one would imagine that that gives the clients a slightly different experience than than dealing with just an, an, an employee with with no offence intended to to any employees that, that may be watching. I think, it, so the, the, the next question then, if I haven't summed it up, is what do you think the benefits are to the, the customers and, and clients of Maslin's? Well, that's it. I think to pick up on what you said near the end there, I want to be a little bit careful that I don't slag off normal employees. But, you know, my next comments are going to be a little bit binary <laughs> to simplify things. But, um, you know, we've all had that situation. Perhaps you've been in a shop and there's... The, the 16 year old there who you ask a question and he shrugs his shoulders, not my department, I don't know. Um, now, you know, employee ownership won't magically solve that. And also there are plenty of staff in business that aren't employee owned who can behave a lot better than that. But I do feel, yeah, you would never get that from someone who is a business owner. 
Um, so, you know, I often think that as a customer, you've got a bit of a choice typically. Do you want to deal with a really, really small business where you will deal with the business owner who for this purpose might, may well just be one person and you know that they'll really care about making you happy because, you know, they are the ones that benefit from the profit to be blunt about it. So if you decide, I don't like dealing with you, I'm going to take my business elsewhere, that person's going to lose out. Whereas if it's an employee, they still get paid their salary regardless. Um, so I think it, it just helps to, to blur those boundaries between someone who's just an employee and someone who's a business owner. And exactly like you suggested, I like to think that from the client's perspective, um, they will feel that and it will be indirect, but just the fact that all of those staff will care that little bit more. Um, so if you can't help with something because it's not your department, you're a little bit more like to think, well, I need this important to me to help this client, even if it's by passing them over to the correct person to do this and making sure I do this in a good way. Because if I don't, that client might go elsewhere, the business profits go down and therefore I directly lose out financially. Um, so it's sort of one of those weird things where in some respects it sounds a bit communist. It's like, hey, let's give power to all the people. Um, but actually it's still, it, it's almost reinforcing everyone to think in a capitalist way of, if I don't do this as a staff member, I will lose out. It's not just about, I get my fixed salary regardless. Um, so um, <laughs> previously you asked about the benefits of the business. Now you've asked about benefits of the clients. I've not really answered either question. You um, have, you really uh, have. Like, uh, lot, very specific to the industry that I'm in. Um, some of the complaints we hear from clients who come to us from other accountancy firms, one of the most common things is, oh, my accountant changed every six months. You know, so they, they would have been uh, a client of one of the bigger firms. Someone comes in, they do their job for a while, they get fed up, they go elsewhere because the staff perhaps aren't treated brilliantly. Maybe their salary is fairly average, they're overworked, whatever it may be. So by looking after those staff a little bit better and directly relating the staff's financial situation with the profitability of the business, the staff do tend to hang around longer. So I think our staff turnover is lower. And again, if you're getting an ongoing service from a business like an accountant, that staff continuity is quite key because you don't have to keep re-explaining the same thing to a new person. Yeah, I, I think when when dealing with, with professionals, lawyers, accountants, doctors, dentists, it's it's comforting to be to be dealing with the same person. So so again, it, it does make a lot of sense. So you, you you just said that you weren't answering the questions, but you, you really are because I I completely get that they are, they aren't simple yes or no answers. This is Alex J from Friday Collective. Um, his LinkedIn settings just mean that um, he's coming up as private user. But Alex is asking, would you advise a certain turnover before implementing this size of structure? And would you say that it's restricted to to certain industries? And I think as Alex Alex's business. Um, along with Dean and, and Nadia, who, who you know, as their business is called Friday Collective, that tells us a little bit about um, about their ethos as well. So Alex is asking, is there a certain turnover and, and does this apply only to certain industries and professions? So it certainly doesn't apply to certain industries or professions. Um, it does seem as though a lot of the businesses that have moved to this in the last few years do seem to be what you might call professional services firms. So, I mean, if anything, lawyers seems to be more common than accountants on this one. Um, architects as well. As to why that is, um, I don't know. I mean, certainly there's some high profile businesses which don't tick that box whatsoever. Uh, so Richer Sounds, you've probably heard of, sell hi-fis and TVs, uh, Go Ape, the sort of assault course in the forest, and Ardman Animation, the people behind Wallace and Gromit, they've all got employee owned in the last few years. They're not professional services firms um, and they all do wildly different things. You know, one's in retail. Well, exactly. Um, in terms of turnover, no, there's certainly not a de minimis level. I mean, there is, if you're a one person business at the moment and you don't have any staff, then there's no one, you know, it's not going to work. Um, so, you know, it is a question I get asked a bit and I asked it myself when we were first looking to do this, we had about 10 staff. And it did seem as though that isn't a very small end of going employee owned. Um, I like to think, and this is totally untested at this stage, but I like to think that there might be a, um, a bigger market for slightly smaller businesses, 
but probably critically the founder would need to stay on and lead that business, albeit now from a position of it's not their company anymore, but they can still lead it. Simply because if you're down at sort of the five staff, perhaps, you just become quite vulnerable. Uh, you know, so of those five, you might have a couple who love their job and are great at it, but have no drive. They just want to come in, do what they're told and go home. That's great. Every business needs people like that, but they can't lead the business and they won't want to lead the business. Um, so you, you do need to have someone who wants to lead the business and ideally more than one, because if you just have one person who wants to lead the business and then they decide they get a lovely offer elsewhere and they disappear, does that mean the business collapses and there's a risk that it will? Um, so, yeah, I think you need enough staff that there's a bit of continuity there. Not here, I'm not talking about dealing with customers, but I'm talking about people who are prepared to take the reins and lead that company. Yeah, I, I, I think at the top of that sentence you were talking about, um, there seems to have been a lot of take up in professional services companies. And I wonder if if that's because accountants and lawyers are really familiar with the concept of, of fee earners and the support team as well, where no one is, is any more important than anyone else. It's just that it's one person or a set of person's job to, to go out and win the business. It's something that we were familiar with in estate agency as well. Some people in the office went out and won the business, did the sales. Other people handled the support of those sales, the support of those customers. So I just wonder if amongst um, professional services clients that that's just more understood and that's why they're, they're, they're going down the, the, the route of this. I didn't know that Richer Sounds was an employee ownership trust, um, but I think you have you have answered Alex's question along the way and you've You've opened up another set of questions about leadership in in your discussion because I hadn't even thought that one through. You even even with the the very flat structure for want of, of of a better expression of the employee ownership trust, you still do need to make sure that you've got leaders in the business. You've you've just appointed directors, so that that becomes even more important or just as important as as in a sort of traditionally owned business. I mean, I think in a, in a small traditionally owned business, if it's your business, you are the leader. But is that always going to be the case? I mean, I imagine 99.9% of the time that's going to be the case. So you will at various points take on employees who will support you um, and, you know, do some of the tasks that either you don't want to do or you're not great at doing or whatever it may be. Um, when your business gets to more sort of 10 staff, 20 staff, whatever it may be, you perhaps will be employing people who are you have some element of leadership requirements themselves. They'll be managing a few people and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just thinking about that because, you know, the thing that I've become very aware of, not everybody wants to lead. So totally ignoring whether they're good at it, there'll be a whole bunch of people that just don't want that because, you know, it, it may come with some extra glory. Your name is prominent at the top as opposed to other people's. Um, it may come with a higher salary, but it also comes with more responsibility, more pressure. Uh, you know, if you're responsible for a team of staff and you make a really bad decision and then some of those staff have to lose their job, that's not a nice feeling to have. Um, so I think, yeah, you know, there are plenty of people out there who are very happy being just employees. Um, and I hope I don't offend anyone there, but, uh, you know, they, they want to follow. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if your business only has people like that, it makes it quite difficult, you know, to pass over to control because you do need someone who is going to step up and say, right, I will take this business forward. I will lead from the front. Yeah. And, and as you said, uh, someone prepared to take some risks, at least calculated risks, uh, I think. And again, the, the, the conversation leads me to other places. So if, if another business, you, you talked earlier about why you chose this instead of a trade sale, but if another business now approached and wanted to buy Maslin's or any other business um, owned by an EOT, what would the what would the process be at that stage? If 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 someone wanted to to make the mythical offer that you can't refuse, what would what would happen at this stage with with Maslin's or or another EOT? So legally, that can happen. Um, in practice, it doesn't tend to. Um, and I think you know, there's there's a a bunch of reasons for that. So, yes, the, the, the trust, I'm going to get a bit legal and geeky for a moment. So the trust itself is a company. So if you search for Maslin's on Companies House, you'll find two companies. You'll find Maslin's Limited, which is the trading business 
and you'll find Maslin's EOT Limited, relatively named, which is, it doesn't do anything. It sits there dormant, but it owns the bulk of the shares of the trading company. And it can sell the shares in that trading company. Um, for it to do so, the trustees would need to approve it, which is basically uh, a majority of the three directors of that trustee company. Um, so there are reasons why that might happen in that, you know, from the staff's perspective, they may be thinking, oh, well, hold on, I do quite like working here and I get paid reasonably well and I get profit shares, but if we sell the business, I'll get a one-off whopping great cash receipt and then either I can keep my job if whoever buys it will keep me on or I can disappear off and, and, and go elsewhere. But in practice, whether that will ever happen, I think is a, a bit doubtful because, I mean, firstly, you've given all of these people basically control of their own destiny. Sounds a little bit cheesy. Um, but for them to sell, sell the business, they would be giving that up. Um, so they might, you know, people might be prepared to do that if they didn't have any long-term intentions of staying with the business. Maybe they want to emigrate or, you know, give up work completely, have children, whatever it may be. But on the whole, you'd need the majority of the staff to want to approve that. You need the trustees to approve that. Um, and I just think overall, that's pretty unlikely. And I, I, I think the, again, as the conversation's going on, one of the things that I've spotted, I'm going to bring it up on screen again. Um, I'm not going to play it, but... If, if you're watching this, go and have a look at maslins.co.uk. Go and have a look at, at Chris Maslin's website. Well, Maslin's the business website. And and have a quick play of the video because having the video right there, front and centre on the website, having asked you about the impact on the business itself, having asked you about the impact on the customers, I know you've told me about the... Um, it measured increased productivity of of um, the team in a in an EOT. But what specifically have what have the Maslin's team had to say about it? How do they all feel about about themselves owning the business? You you, you must have talked about it at some point. I think probably most of those conversations about that will go on when I'm not in the room. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, you know, I imagine they have very positive conversations about it sometimes, all excited about all the great new things they could do and, and the opportunities that would bring and the extra money that might bring. And I'm sure they also occasionally have some slightly panicked conversations of, you know, what if it all goes wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I probably, yeah, I suppose I was involved in conversations like that prior to the sale, um, but largely to do with what was the direct impact going to be on people's roles? So not only mine, but the senior staff, what, what's going to change? Um, so, you know, we put a lot of effort more for the, for the clients than for the staff, but just to trying to, trying to make sure there isn't any panic. You know, generally speaking, people hate change, especially if they're happy enough with things as they are. So if you're fairly content and then you hear something's changing, you go, uh-oh, I don't like this. Um, but overall, I, I don't really see how it can be a negative thing, he says. Um, I mean, yeah, I need a better answer to, to that. Um, yeah, the staff don't really involve any questions about how they feel about employee ownership anymore, because I, yeah, I, I suppose if they have any grumbles, they might not want me to hear them. And if they feel it's ridiculously good, they might not want me to hear that either. So. I'm going to I'm going to put this up on the screen because if if you're watching this and you want to connect with Chris do go go and find him um on LinkedIn and connect with him there if if someone's watching or listening to this Chris and interested in turning their their their, their own business into an EOT what what sort of questions should they be asking themselves first? Um, so I suppose we've, we've, we've touched on a few of them, you know, in terms of is your business in a suitable position for that to happen? So like I say, you need to have, I feel at least a couple of staff, you, you could get away with just one who really wants to take the lead and 
you trust because you don't want there to be just one maverick person who's going to take the lead, make some rash decisions on day one, potentially screw the whole thing up and then walk away going, oh, whoops, that didn't work out. Um, so you need someone who is stable and competent to take the lead going forwards. Um, you need to be extremely aware of the fact that you are giving up control of your business. Um, there's, there's no two ways about that. Um, so it's not something to step into lightly. Um, there's a few course, well, I'd recommend if you're interested in it, um, by all means have a private chat with me, but also have a look at the Employee Ownership Association, the EOA. Um, they do various events, uh, which you know, currently are nearly all on Zoom, as is the case for most things these days. Um, but a lot of them you can attend without being a paying member. Um, they've got a lot of useful guidance out there. Um, predominantly that will revolve on the soft side of things because I think you know a lot of people would agree that's the most important side. So there are things, you know, there's exciting tax breaks available, there's complex legal stuff to go through, but the reality is, is that unless the staff happily take the business on post-transfer, all the geeky technical stuff becomes a bit irrelevant. But if someone, not but if, and if someone is considering doing it, you're a good person to talk to. You're, you're, you're able to give advice about this and as part of your business, you can actually advise someone or consult someone on, on the transfer to a to an EOT? Uh, TBC. Um, <laughs> so at this stage, no, I, I'd be very happy. I'd just be having a chat as a human being, as someone who has done this, um, has probably had a lot of the concerns. Anyone who's, who's watching this and might be thinking about having it um, has been through it and can hopefully offer a few pointers. Um, if you're seriously considering it, um, like I say, probably step one is working out if it's viable for your company as it is. So as well as the staffing side, which we've talked about, there is no minimum level of profit required, but you're only going to get paid if there are reasonably reliable profits for long enough to get whatever amount you want from the business. Um, so, you know, that does mean it can work quite well for what I might call boring businesses that make nice, reliable, steady profits but it's not really viable for your sort of Silicon Valley type startup. You know, the situation where you say, well, look, we're losing money year after year, but because of this astronomical growth, our business is worth a billion pounds. Well, fine, but you're gonna need some external cash to come in for, for that to work. You know, if you're gonna sell any of your shares, that just won't work with an employee ownership trust. So you need a, a stable, boring business that makes reliable, regular profits. You need a team who are competent enough to take it forward, you know, that does mean not just doing their day job, but also making decisions going forwards. Um, if you're happy you've got those things in place, then yeah, have a chat with the EOA, have a chat with myself, maybe have a chat with your accountant if you've got one, just to see if they have any familiarity with it. Um, I mean, there's various things you need to do to actually do the transfer itself. So I'm happy to discuss those, but um, you know, you'd want to, tick a whole bunch of boxes before you got to the transfer stage. Because if you if you rush to the transfer, you then sold your business to the EOT. If you then realize your business wasn't suitable, you've got a horrendous mess on your hands and you potentially just destroyed your business overnight. Um, so yes, do not rush into it. I, I can't, Im yeah, it, it, it's one of the reasons I find you so interesting to talk to because I can't imagine you rushing into stuff whereas that would be my tendency. So I, I can see that you would be a really good person to um, to talk to about it. If anyone wants to talk to Chris about this, go and find him on LinkedIn. I'm going to bring that up one last time before you and I finish off for the afternoon. Um, that's where you'll find Chris on LinkedIn. Chris Maslin, M-A-S-L-I-N. Um, pretty Well, very easy to find on there, but do go and connect with Chris and ask him, any questions that you've got about EOTs? Any final points that you want to make that I haven't covered, Chris, before we wrap up for the afternoon? Well, yeah, so just to, to touch on the TBC bit. So I am currently working towards um, making what will hopefully be a relatively cheap and cheerful uh, EOT transfer service. Um, because if you do get to a stage where you're happy, you want to transfer your business, you're happy, it's ready, it's making money, et cetera, et cetera. At the moment, you do need quite a lot of separate parties involved and it can be quite expensive so independent of the soft side of things where you may well want to you know get some coaching both for yourself 
and how it's going to change your role, but also the senior team. You need to have someone to formally value your business. Um, you can then sell for any amount up to that. You cannot sell more than that. Um, you're also typically going to need solicitors um, because it, it's a business sale um, and you're having a trust set up, which needs a trust deed. Um, so it's one of those things where superficially it can seem quite annoying that the, the legal fees and the professional fees can be quite high for this because you feel a little bit like nothing's really happening. It's just, it, it feels like a paperwork exercise. You know, the staff still come in and do the same job. You as founder may potentially still come in and do the same job. And there's just been a geeky change behind the scenes, um, but it is a significant one. So yes, I, I am currently working on that, trying to make a, a, a sort of almost off the shelf package, shall we say. Um, but it, yeah, it's going to be something that certainly before pressing ahead with that, people need to make very, very sure they've got their, their ducks lined up and they know exactly what they're doing because otherwise, yeah, otherwise your business is gone. Because you've, you've got experience already in taking, in simplifying something that, that was really complex because you've, you've also got a business helping people to, um, exit their business via a an MVL, a, a member's voluntary liquidation. And that's, you've already, you use the word productized quite a lot, but you, you've already sort of made that a lot simpler for people than, than it was before. Yeah. So, you know, my background is in accountancy, um, but I increasingly as time went on, I sort of got less and less interested in the quirky niche cases. You know, there are some people that love nothing more than the niche ones where they can go and dive into their textbooks. That really was not for me. Um, so what I'm perhaps almost drifting towards doing is being a little bit like IKEA art of furniture, um, but with <laughs> nowhere near as wide a range. But what I mean by that is that, you know, at the moment there's various things where you might go to a professional firm and get something very bespoke done and it's quite expensive. Um, and what I'm trying to do is saying, well, can I boil that down? What are the simple, the key things that people want from that service? What are the bits that are, if we're honest, extra fluff that may be legally required, but we can just template that because no one's really interested in it. Um, and if we can do all of that and comply with whatever regulations are required, we can potentially streamline it and, and offer it at a much lower price. So yeah, to some, I mean, Madison's was in no way the first to do that with one person who contracted businesses. I wouldn't in any way claim they were, um, but that's sort of what they've done. And MBL Online, as you allude to, did exactly that. Uh, there was a change in tax legislation that suddenly meant some geeky process that previously hardly anyone would want to bother going through suddenly became massively appealing. Um, it's not something that I could offer. You need a licensed insolvency practitioner. Um, but I teamed up with one and yeah, we just kind of boiled that, boiled the process down to its absolute basics, stripping away all of the unnecessary things, getting clients to perhaps have to jump through some hoops beforehand so that we can then, you know, make a factory line. Um, and yeah, to some extent, that's what I'm hoping to do with the, the EOT transfer as well. So to end that then, if anyone's also, if anyone's got any questions about members' voluntary liquidations, MVLs, ask Chris about those as well. Thank you, Chris. I've I've really enjoyed talking to you this afternoon. Um, it, LinkedIn, the, the best place for people to connect with you? I, I know you're also active on some other platforms, but would LinkedIn be the best place for, for people to find you? Yes, if, if you want to speak to me about some of the stuff we've done today, then I'd suggest LinkedIn. Um, I mean, if you've got any interest in the underlying businesses we've talked about, then probably, on, you know, well, by all means, speak to me, but I would then point you on. Um, so, yeah, maslins.co.uk, mvlonline.co.uk are the respective businesses there where you can find information about what they offer and, and how to press ahead if you want to. Brilliant. Chris, I always enjoy talking to you, but we've, we've talked publicly if that's the right word for the first time so thank you very much um i'm going to pull you off screen in a second and then i'll press the button to to stop this um but yeah thank you for joining us this afternoon chris no worries cheers Devin. thank you very much i'm just gonna do